So it is a great pleasure today that I introduce uh, Robert Sheridan, past president of the American Burn Association and featured speaker today for the Hansboro Memorial Lecture. Dr. Sheridan. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm, I'm, uh, let me sort out my buttons here. So I just want to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Potenza, who is actually my role model. I mean, I'm, uh, we're the same generation, the same uh, uh, stuff, you know, the burn trauma, uh, acute care surgery sort of uh, side of, of, of the burn care world. And, uh, and I admire a lot of his career and what he does. And he's been a good friend over the years. This is what I'd like to talk about. I'm from the East Coast, I'll talk fast. And um, uh, this whole thing about the lessons uh, is, is a discipline that was uh, 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 a challenge to me in this, what they have, they have a surgical boot camp across town. It's not in the Harvard system, but I get to be the burn guy for this surgical boot camp. And the challenge is to take what you've learned since the end of your training and distill it into as few words as possible. And it's actually a very interesting exercise, kind of like writing an abstract to, uh, to fit the, uh, the, the small uh, word count. And uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do today, is go through what I've learned. Of course, I'll highlight the projects I was involved in and, and maybe tangentially mentioned uh, the work of others. But especially uh, John Hansborough was a, always a role model for me. And so I'd like to just first uh, give you a quick tour of our unit. Uh, this is uh, Boston Shrine, uh, which is across the street from the MGH. And we uh, are a full-service burn hospital. We, you know, our program has a pediatric and a adult uh, embedded uh, ICUs like yours do, acute care units. We have uh, wonderful nursing staff, as you can see here. And a uh, you know, big reconstructive program. That's about half of what we do now is reconstructive work. Um, we have four operating rooms with the program that uh, run every day and you know, do the whole wide range of uh, acute and reconstructive uh, uh, burn operations. A very busy outpatient clinic that I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, um, which has become a really dominant theme in our program. Uh, busy rehab programs, and of course we have you know, music therapy, child life, the Shriners fund a great deal of this, uh, this uh, additional uh, 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 program programmatic material. Uh, very family-centered environment. We bring the siblings in, the families in. We have uh, family apartments uh, in our building. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this isn't quite what they look like, but you get the idea. We really try to take care of the families. We now have around 20 kids sort of in local housing orbit at any one time, and we've developed relationships with uh, uh, charities and individuals who will house our patients for us. Uh, we really try to bond with our community. This is uh, one of our patients with uh, uh, Shane Victorino and uh, uh, David Ortiz and uh, Daniel Nava in front of our hospital when they were stuck in a traffic jam in their duck boat uh, tour. And uh, you know, we try to be everybody's resource for burns. We really ha try to have as many relationships as we can. Uh, Bruce mentioned our international programs. Our, the Shriners uh, allow us to use the resource in a cost-effective way, and so we have a lot of partnerships uh, in Central America. And this, kids like this who would clearly die in the, this intensive care unit in San Pedro Sula, uh, you know, we bring them up to Boston, we, you know, we close their wounds, we send them home, and then we see them in follow-up clinics and do revisions down there. And It's a wonderful partnership uh, with programs. And uh, we've been uh, part of the uh, Burn Center Verification Program since its inception. This is our first certificate. <laughs> And basically, we try to have a lot of fun at, at work. And I know that uh, uh, Dr. Potenza does the same thing. You know, he really enjoys what he does, and he, that, that spirit goes everywhere. I'd like to just mention John Hansborough. You know, I met, I didn't know him personally, but I certainly met him, and I sat in many meetings with him at the ABA and uh, with uh, various uh, research uh, programs. And I was the young guy, and he was the rising supernova. I mean, the guy was just absolutely everything. Clinical expert, research leader, inspiring teacher. Everybody loved him that worked for him. A devoted family man, you know, and he, quietly he was leading us through this minefield of stress that our field is prone to. We talked about this a little bit last night, and I'll mention it briefly at the end of my talk here, that, uh, you know, he was a leader in this area too, and he kind of, you know, he taught us a lot both technically and in this, this regard. And as far as the, now to jump into the lessons learned, I didn't, this isn't my idea. You can see this name, Dr. Potenza here, uh, started this whole lessons learned idea of trying to uh, distill uh, a lot of uh, disparate work into some nice uh, take home messages. And so here's that boot camp challenge to take what you've learned and really uh, cull it down to just as few words as possible. And this is even true in uh, uh, 
shrunk in white. You know, a sentence should be should contain no unnecessary words, like a machine, no unnecessary parts. And so, and then uh, it, and when I when you get the boot camp uh, sort of uh, introduction, this is what they try to tell you that. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of words to say something. In fact, the more it's, it's like an inverse relationship between the amount of words and the uh, the, F, the you know the message. So, uh, what I'm going to do is now go through what I've learned in outcomes area, which has been fun for me, uh, and then some in the unit lessons, outside the unit lessons, some lessons at home, and then some quick take homes. And so, I'd like to start with outcomes because this sort of frames the, uh, uh, Dr. Kane was talking about a, a, a mentor we both had in our training, Vic Garcia, who uh, sort of would step back and frame the problem in the bigger context of the patient's life. And it really makes a big difference. And I think this is a, a really important part of what we should do. It used to be all about survival. And, you know, basically that's not that much of an issue now. Most of our units, most of our patients are going to survive. And the elderly, you know, there'll be some elderly patients that, that don't make it. And you can see the statistics up here. If, you know, you're, if you're over 60 with a big burn, you're not, you may not do well. Uh, in children, almost all of our patients are going to survive, even the very small ones. In fact, in our unit now, age doesn't even come out as a predictor of mortality. There's no association. This is data from our unit uh, over time. Uh, about 7,000 patients in this cohort. And essentially, if children arrive alive, uh, there's almost no mortality. Um, and, uh, but quality of life is really where it's at. And it's been my uh, uh, privilege to be involved in this uh, now for about 15 years in the ABA Shriners Outcome uh, Program as a small participant. And I've really learned a lot from this. And so, uh, but I think the, the idea that you really need to be able to measure your outcomes, define your outcomes, and track your outcomes to optimize them is, is an important concept. My first involvement with this was uh, the first uh, outcomes project we did at, at our hospital. We were concerned, at least I was concerned, uh, we were all concerned that maybe we weren't doing uh, some of our patients a favor by resuscitating them if they came in with really gigantic burns. And so we went ahead and tracked 100% of the patients that had a 70% or greater full thickness injury that were ever admitted to Boston Shriners from the time it opened almost 50 years ago. And we, we found them. As part of the grant, we had to hire a private detective, uh, which was funded by the grant because a lot of the patients in the early years didn't have Social Security numbers. And, but we did find 100%. And we found that um, uh, uh, and so we tracked them down, we interviewed them, we did the SF36, the short form 36, which you may know is a quality of life study. It's widely used with eight domains of function, both emotional and physical, and it's normed for age and gender for North Americans, and therefore becomes a very powerful outcome tool. And uh, so we found 100% of these patients, we had uh, uh, 15 years of follow-up. These were kids who were, you know, badly burned when they were young. Uh, the average age, I think, was eight years at the time of injury. 70% uh, or more full thickness. And most of them were out there paying taxes, having jobs, going to school, having children. It was really very rewarding and actually kind of surprising to me. And the, the, the real shocker was the SF36 scores did not differ from national norms except for in the purely physical domains where about 20% of them had physical scores more than two standard deviations below the norm. And uh, I think that speaks to the highly ablative surgical style that was typified the early years of our field. And I know Dr. Portenza probably does m many more layered excisions now than he did when he was young, just as I do. And I think those excisions tend to be much more functional aesthetically and functionally. And uh, you know, we picked this data apart and we just tried to figure out what can we influence that will optimize these outcomes. And so we graded the families as, uh, that the, the discharge family as uh, the, the degree of support, that the, uh, the functionality of the family, early reintegration and consistent follow-up. And what that meant was if, if the, the child was discharged to a functional family, good housing, no substance abuse, uh, their SF36 scores at 15 years were statistically significantly better than, uh, than if they were not discharged to a functional family. And so we really uh, take that data and help fund our family services program, which really helps to make the family stronger. The early reintegration effort was interesting. We, uh, there was a, uh, uh, many of these kids, especially in the early years, were sheltered after discharge. They would be discharged with no fingers, maybe
face, a disfigured face, and they would then go to home tutoring and that sort of thing. And then there was a move to mainstream the kids where they would go back to their regular school and go back on the soccer field. And the kids, and we dichotomized the data, and we looked at the kids that were mainstream and those that were, were not. And the kids that were mainstreamed had very statistically significantly better scores at 15 years. And so we used that to support a reintegration program. We send a group to the school to teach the other kids. And you know, we call the coach and say, we'll give them a new skin graft, don't worry. And uh, um, you know, this, this mainstreaming, many of the kids don't like it up front but it really pays off in the long run. And then the consistent follow-up was also interesting and we dichotomized the kids into those who uh, kept coming back to the hospital year after year after year to our multidisciplinary aftercare program and those that didn't, that were scattered to their community, they might have the same resources, but they didn't have it in a one cohesive place. And the kids that were mainstreamed, and then the kids that kept coming back to the clinic actually had worse injuries, as you would expect, uh, but they had better outcomes. And so it was very interesting to see uh, kids with a worse physical injury have a better long-term outcome in multiple domains. The only difference that we could detect was the fact that they kept coming back to the clinic. And at first I thought that that was because we were so great in the clinic, but then I realized it was probably because we're so inefficient in the clinic that they spend a lot of time in the waiting room with each other and the parents are talking and, and, uh, um, and so I think there's a lot to that support and we're, you, we've used that data to help grow our, our relationship with the uh, survivors organization, the Phoenix Society, with their uh, survivor um, um, uh, program, their SOAR program, uh, where they uh, can uh, help uh, newly injured patients and families recover. The next uh, sort of iteration of this outcomes uh, program was the Shriners and ABA collaboration uh, under the Ron Tompkins leadership and the ABA. And this has been about a 15 year effort uh, and it really has been a, a privilege to be a part of this. Um, and what we've tried to do is come up with more granular outcomes uh, uh, scales and scores, all normed to age and gender. There's a, uh, goes, they are normed all the way through the young adult through the, the, through, through the late 20s. And um, so there's these 12 domains which you see on your right. And we've been enrolling kids in this now for about six years. We have about 1,800 kids now out to six years with uh, this data repeated over and over again, year after year. Um, and so it's this enormous data set. And we're just now starting to query this data set. And uh, here's one of the first uh, queries we did was the, we looked at what is the, does the family have an influence on the recovery of the child in domains? And so we took 400 families and we uh, gave them this, uh, uh, this, uh, this tool called the Family Environment Scale, which has been around since the 60s, divides families into these 10 domains and will grade them as to the strength uh, or weakness in these various domains. And we found some extremely statistically significantly uh, strong relationships between various uh, components of outcome and, uh, and uh, the quality of the family. And so now we can teach the family some of these skills. And for example, uh, the domain of appearance is not what the child looks like, but what the child thinks they look like. And the queries on that domain are, you know, will anyone ever marry me? Will people ever want to touch me? Will people be afraid of me? And those are really meaningful uh, questions. And uh, kids score much better and they recover much quicker in that domain if they come from an expressive family. And uh, so, and you can teach families to be expressive and to talk about the issues. And uh, a, co a cohesive family also has much better uh, recovery uh, over time. And so we, we can use these tools to help coach the families. The, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, and, and, and this has led to sort of a, a series of these studies that have been coming out about uh, how our long-term outcomes at this granular level are affected by our, our early interventions. And this is another one. This was the, this is, uh, I think comes out next, this month in Journal of Trauma. And this was uh, a study of uh, the influence of the intensity of early pain control on long-term outcomes. And what we found is that some of the, uh, the stressors and the stress-related symptomatology that kids will have as the years go by related to their injury are truncated by early pain control. And this is, so if you treat the kid, uh, the child very uh, early on with an, uh, very good quality pain control, uh, they're gonna have durable impact of that intervention four years out that's statistically significant. 
And uh, so we use that to help uh, uh, justify our pain control measures in our expensive membranes. I know uh, Dr. Potenz was talking about Dr. Hansborough's uh, uh, use of uh, a desire for these temporary membranes to obviate the need for painful dressing changes, and that's a big deal. And that does have fallout years and years later. Um, the next uh, part of this is interventions. And so uh, what we, the next uh, study that's uh, is sort of uh, right now is, I'm writing this up actually, it's on my laptop, I was doing it on the airplane. And that is uh, we took some of the controversial questions in Burns, and let me just cut to the, uh, amplify a, for a few of these. And we made these into a null hypothesis and talked about does uh, colloid early make a difference? Does uh, tube feedings early make a difference? And uh, um, we're using our outcome data to see the, influence, the impact of uh, those early acute interventions on their long-term outcome. And uh, so far, it, it's very interesting in that a lot of the things we argue about don't have a lot of impact on uh, the long-term outcome, but some of the things we don't think about much uh, do, and some of the so early social interventions on the family may actually be very impactful uh, down the road. The next uh, outcomes program here, uh, we've just started this year, as we're uh, uh, very uh, honored to be a, uh, a, a NIDR site uh, for Burns, and uh, uh, with uh, Jeff Schneider and Colleen Riding leading the way at the Sh uh, Spalding Rehab Hospital, we've really uh, been able to bring together all the city's burn programs into this, and this is going to be a lot of fun with this. Uh, we have a course at the ABA coming up if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about this. I found this a very confusing area early on, and I still find it a little bit confusing. There's always something to learn. Uh, but we are going to try to teach uh, some of the concepts of develop, designing these outcome studies uh, at this a year's ABA in March in Boston. And, um, and then the, the final thing uh, on this outcomes lessons that I uh, am very excited about is uh, is the idea of can we use this data in real time to intervene? And uh, so we know what the quality uh, components of a quality outcome are. These are what we think these 12 uh, domains of, of a quality granular outcome are. And uh, uh, we now have a tool that we can track it. We can track it in, in real time, and we can compare it to a norm that is stratified by injury severity and patient age. And so now with this data, can we intervene early? And this is the, this is the goal, and this just got approved by the, uh, the uh, IRB last week. And we haven't started yet, but the idea is to track the child. The, the blue would be the child's projected outcome in domain X. And then <clears throat> we would track this in real time with every clinic visit uh, in the waiting room and uh, alert the physician to the fact that the child's falling off their recovery curve, much like a growth curve in a pediatrician's office. And so that, you know, if you see the child falling off in domain X, you can have a focused intervention. And that's the, uh, that's the, the goal here. And I think this is going to be really a lot of fun to do. So, that was, uh, that's lessons in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, about outcomes. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just jump to some lessons in the unit. And these are basically the issues that we sometimes uh, argue about uh, at the ABA and uh, some of the take home uh, uh, lessons that I've had here. I'm going to divide this into the various phases of care, the initial evaluation and resuscitation, uh, excision biologic closure and critical care, definitive wound closure, and all the way out through the outpatient program. And in phase one, you know, it's all about an accurate resuscitation. I'm a big believer in early colloid. I just got an email uh, about a kid en route from Western Mass, extricated from a house fire. And as soon as that child hits the door, uh, we'll be starting a colloid resuscitation. Very, and I'd be happy to talk about the details of that later uh, offline. Uh, liberal decompression, um, you never, uh, never miss an opportunity to decompress. And uh, another lesson I've learned is that uh, small burns don't need a calculated resuscitation. You know, maintenance, maintenance and a half fluid, a, a regular observation, and most of these children will do really well. Big burns do well with early colloid. And again, I, I know this is something you probably do already, and it's creeping into your practice, but as a formalized part of the practice, it really has become a big part of ours. Um, in terms of monitoring the resuscitations, uh, no formula beats obsessive monitoring and titration. We had a picky fellow rotating it with us the other day, or a couple of months ago, who, who gave me this quote that you can't spell doc without OCD. And I, and I really like that. You know, it, it, it really speaks to the fact that you just got to be by the bedside and, and make those observations and adjust titrate up and down based on you know, your standard resuscitation endpoints and some of the softer ones as well. 
And this is even more uh, important in uh, concomitant injury, high voltage injuries, concomitant MVAs, fractures, crush injuries, et cetera. And uh, never miss an opportunity to decompress. Um, uh, it's not just the loss of muscle tissue, but I, it, my, my impression is that if you don't do very, practice very liberal decompression, there's a lot of neurologic symptoms that you see down the road uh, that uh, you know, it may not translate into a you know, loss of muscle or, or septic extremity, but uh, I think that you minimize your, uh, your neurologic uh, uh, morbidity down the road by decompressing early, and of course you minimize your, your uh, um, your muscle morbidity. And it's not just the extremities that need, need decompression. This is, a, this is a lateral canthotomy being done in our unit. And we see this sometimes with a very deeply burned face where uh, there may be some retrobulbar, retrobulbar edema developing. And if we don't decompress this, we can watch the tonometer pressure goes up. And that can't be good for vision down the road. And so we are very liberal uh, with decompressing these when the uh, intraocular pressure rises. Uh, abdominal compartment syndrome doesn't always need a laparotomy. About half of these are related to just too much colloid, too much uh, crystalloid up front and can be treated with a DPL catheter. Um, and this is not necessarily a terrible thing either. We, 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 when we need to do this, we do it. Uh, we do it up in the unit and we close the abdomens uh, within a few days and the, those patients will generally still do well. Uh, in terms of uh, abuse issues, uh, I've learned to just all, never be, uh, always be suspicious, but never be judgmental. This is just a, it's always a tragedy for everybody involved. It's not usually as clear, clean as a evil person, and a, uh, it, it's usually quite a complicated issue, and, and, but staying engaged in it is important. In terms of burn depth, uh, this is still a clinical art. We've been involved with uh, all kinds of uh, 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 optical coherence tomography and indocyanin and green injections to uh, do our burn depth determinations. But basically, it's still, uh, I think, uh, a practiced eye is still the best uh, judge of the burn's ability to heal and need for excision. Uh, in electrical injuries, I've learned that you know the decompressed debris close cycle can be completed usually pretty quickly in the first week, and uh, if it's if it's uh, uh, if it's elaborated in just that way, decompress day one, debris day two, three, four, and start to close day uh, five and on. Uh, in tens, uh, we see a fair amount of this as you probably do as well. And I have gone from the aggressive debridement and xenografting of these in the OR to just a very gentle supportive wound care only. All this uh, necrotic epithelium will collapse and perform, be a real nice biologic dressing. And, and um, I think that works in a lot of the children very, very well. And see probably as many cold injuries as we do, but the, what I've learned over the recent years is that th thrombolytics do have a role in this. And we have now nine patients in our little mini-series um, where we've, they've come in hard frozen. We've thawed them like we do in the 40-degree uh, soaks, and they don't reperfuse. We'll take them to angio. Uh, we'll do an angi angiogram with uh, with uh, uh, vas intraarterial vasodilators, and we'll see the absence of digital flow. We'll go ahead and uh, put those uh, patients on TPA, and about half of them will completely reperfuse, and uh, um, and and it can be a real it can be a real game changer in those uh, rare patients if they have a short ischemia time. In phase two, the initial excision, closure, and critical care phase of this. Um, I think it's all about a, a staged hemostatic excision, uh, emphasis on the hemostatic. Uh, physiologic closure of only clean wounds, not dirty wounds. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Potenza has also noticed this trend toward a non-ablative approach to the operations. We're just taking the dead stuff off, uh, much fewer fascial excisions. We tried this with a, a CO2 laser. We had this high-powered CO2 scanning laser, and we'd ablate the eschar. It wouldn't bleed. We'd graft it. We did it in a bunch of sw uh, swine, and then we uh, had a trial with 20 uh, patients. And you know it can be done, but the standard techniques, if you're very obsessive about hemostasis with usual excisional techniques, sub-escar sub epinephrine clysis, tourniquets, you can do these excisions with very little blood loss. And you don't need to do these uh, ablative excisions that we used to do, these uh, you know, routine um, uh, fascial excisions that, that I used to do uh, are, are much less uh, commonly necessary if you use sort of a layered uh, technique. In terms of uh, lines, uh, we, uh, we are, have a very low uh, 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 
problem right with our lines where it, because we obsess over them, we're very careful about their placement. Uh, we recently uh, published 1,000 consecutive uh, pediatric lines and our mechanical complication rate was 0.2%. And that is because we are we're doing it in the OR with the attending breathing down the neck of the resident and uh, we really take it very seriously. Uh, MDR, multi-drug resistant bacteria, are everywhere. We import a lot of these from our sister programs. And so we assume every patient is colonized with this and we have sort of a police state of infection control in our unit. But it really pays off for us in terms of uh, uh, the absence, essentially, of any crosses. This is the kind of patient we get from our Central American partner units where they're usually, you know, a month out, they're cachectic. Uh, they're covered with resistant bacteria and just assuming it's there, pressing ahead uh, is really the, the, uh, um, the way to manage these kids. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, feedings, as uh, Dr. Hansbro taught us, we're uh, great advocates of early enteral feeds and we put those feeding tubes in right away if the children are eating and we start the enteral feeds while we're doing the resuscitations. And VAX, you know, I love VAX, we use them a lot. Um, I operated on a, I had the opportunity to operate on a very uh, morbidly obese person this weekend and did a big layered excision and uh, we just put a vac on it. And so we'll change those vacs and we'll graft that and that paradigm I think is, is going to become more and more um, uh, of uh, a more, more and more commonplace. It works well for us. Uh, phase three, the definitive wound closure, day seven, you know, sort of through the rest of uh, uh, um, the hospitalization, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, this is sort of gilding the lily here, uh, but focusing well on the uh, face, hands, and uh, uh, really planning the surgery around active rehabilitation is the key. Uh, coordinate care with everyone, uh, especially the family is the key. Uh, prevent what you can prevent uh, through uh, ranging, and I won't uh, belabor this, but I think that having active therapists in your intensive care unit is really key. It prevents a lot of morbidity and minimizes a lot of late operations. Uh, what I've learned about skin substitutes is still a disappointment. You know, they're, they're out there. We have our own projects. You have your projects. There's still nothing that beats split thickness autographed uh, for most kids and most adults. And I wish it were not, were not true. And I'm sure soon it will be uh, not true that we won't be using donor sites like we used to. And I, but I've been saying this now for about 20 years and that it's just around the corner. And I, I sure hope it is when it's my turn to, to need this kind of surgery. Um, rehab reconstruction, uh, this is a big part of our practice. We have six full-time therapists in a 30-bed hospital. And the tactics here, I think, are just to plan the surgery around the patient's life, really uh, uh, manage their scars, uh, have a very strong multimodality interventions, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But I think the key to a good phase four is staying actively engaged over time. Stay friendly with the family, uh, see them in the clinic, uh, know what their needs are, know what their unique needs are, and do those. Um, we talk about lasers a lot now in my shop, and uh, lasers do have a role in a multidisciplinary scar management program. We can talk about that offline. This is the PDL laser. Here's the fractional CO2 laser. We do use these. We use them frequently in conjunction with, uh, as a standalone for scar management, they don't work. But as a, uh, an adjunct to usual interventions, surgical and medical interventions for scarring, they really do, I think, have a place. And the final part of the, uh, the burn unit part of this is the outpatient program. And I've got to say that uh, in our hospital, the outpatient world has exploded in the last five to seven years. And uh, we now see about seven to 8,000 outpatient encounters a year. Our clinic is 24-7. And um, patients who we used to manage as inpatients, we, they're, they're home, they're coming back and forth to the clinic. This is, I just got this email last night from uh, um, our OR director at the Shrine. And so you can see we do about 120 cases a month at Shriners, maybe 100 in the adult unit. And so our, our case volume is rising slowly, um, but our inpatient census is about half what it was 10 years ago. And so instead of an inpatient census pushing 30, we have an inpatient census in the high teens, and the difference is the outpatient program. We have kids in orbit, we have kids in f staying with local families, we have kids in local group homes, uh, kids in hotels, we have contracts with hotels. It's really an incredible uh, change, uh, but it really has been made possible by putting a lot of resources into the outpatient program.
program and having the clinic available all the time. And so, you know, if they call from the ED in uh, Bay State in Western Massachusetts and say, I've got a kid with a scalded hand and it's midnight, we say, send him down, we'll see him right now. And, uh, and we'll send him right home. And it really works well. So uh, in terms of outside the unit, let me just jump uh, to, uh, to that. Uh, it's been my good fortune through uh, 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 collaborations and through my Shriners job to uh, participate in a lot of outreach clinics. And uh, I've been uh, able to, to stick with the reserves for uh, quite a few years and, and had uh, deployments. And, and uh, we have a uh, National Disaster Medical System has a, burns, has a disaster uh, uh, a DMAT team uh, at our hospital that I've had the opportunity to participate with and uh, you know go places with them. We had the station fire um, and uh, we collaborate with Project Hope and so we send groups there. In fact a group, a small group just went to the Philippines and had a chance to you know spend some time with the Navy um, off Indonesia and uh, um, so, and then as Bruce said, I was, I, I was uh, operating in uh, Haiti uh, when the earthquake happened uh, uh, at one of the partners in health hospitals uh, and got to stay for a few couple of weeks after that and sort of uh, learned a lot about uh, how to manage uh, that kind of an issue. Um, and uh, so this is what I'd like to do is just sort of uh, distill that into some lessons that I've learned. And here I'm going to go quickly through them. I think the most important thing when you contemplate these uh, activities is to understand why you're there. Um, and usually it is uh, uh, to learn something, to have an interesting experience. Um, you're not going to change the world when you do this. Um, you know, the systems of care that we have that we take for granted are so much uh, deeper than uh, the systems of care in Haiti or in Central America that there's no chance you're going to really make a big impact on the system. But you can make a big act impact on one person. And I think if you go with that as your goal is to help, you know, one or two people and not change a system, uh, then uh, I think you can be, you can have a, you can have an impact. Uh, it's important to understand how limited and transient your role is. And the other thing is that I've learned anyway is to always go with a solid organization. Don't go anywhere by yourself. Uh, and you know, we've been very fortunate to have partners of a lot of different uh, types. Uh, we never say no to a partnership and um, uh, that's the safe way and the effective way to go. Uh, always pay attention to the logistic details, get every shot, even the smallpox, and uh, uh, know the area, know some vocabulary, uh, bring the stuff you're supposed to bring, don't be a burden. Um, and I, this is a hard lesson for me to learn. This is understand the technical limits of, you, of yourself and your equipment and really be honest with yourself. You know, you really shouldn't be doing um, cases that you're not really good at especially in a resource constrained environment and even though the natural history of just leaving the problem alone is not tasteful or uh, is, 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 is makes you unhappy, uh, it's important to really stay away from cases that you really shouldn't be doing except in exceptional circumstances. I know during the earthquake you know, I did cases that I hadn't done in years or I had never done and you know well, I think I got away with it most of the time but that was an exceptional circumstance and I think that when you go on a planned trip you, really, you, you will be drawn into cases that you're really not competent for and you should have the ego strength to say no. Um, the other thing is uh, understand the system of the in-place system of care. There's always an in-place system of care. It may not be very good. This may be the intensive care unit, but when you go, it's still going to be the intensive care unit. So you don't want to create problems for them. If this is the hospital, uh, when you get there, this is going to be the hospital when you leave, unless you have a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of time. And uh, so you shouldn't be burdening this system with the aftercare of cases that they are not equipped for. And that's been the beautiful part of the shrine is that, you know, if uh, there's a case that, um, you know, really isn't appropriate to do in that environment, you can bring that case home and uh, the Shriners will let you do that and our board will let you do that. And thinking about where these patients go, they don't, you know, hop in the family car and go home. I mean, it may be three buses, two days, a long walk to a place with no plumbing and no electricity. And so it's important to plan your operation and your interventions and you don't want to make their life worse in trying to make it better. There may not be any rehab needs in the places where you're sending your patients and maybe they're better off with you not intervening acutely. 
And there's always a lot of kids wherever you go, and so being comfortable with kids I think is very important. And there's always some interesting surgical problems that you've never seen, and so asking for help uh, is really, really, really key. And this was another hard one for me, and, and you know, you have the, at least I had the vision, I'd go down there, I'd teach how to do this operation, and usually the, pay, the doctors down there, they're excellent. The surgeons are very, uh, clinically, they're better than, than certainly than I am most of the time and they're very knowledgeable. It's really about this system, and it's not a knowledge deficit. Um, th these are guys who uh, operate in constrained resources all the time. Uh, they are very quick to learn. Uh, it's not a new technique thing. It's really just a, a resource thing, and uh, unless you're prepared to bring them resources, uh, you should bring your teaching in a very humble way. And so I try to just focus on making durable relationships. Um, we've have been able to go from zero to now, you know, well over 50 patients a year that come up from Honduras. Uh, we do their surgery, we make them, we close their wounds and we send them home and then we go back and do clinics and if the operation is relatively small, we'll do that down there. If the operation is bigger, we'll bring them back to Boston and that has really been a tremendous privilege and making those relationships is great. I learn more than, they, than, than the people I visit learn and always plan for your departure because you're not going to be there very long and you really don't want to leave uh, a mess for somebody else to take care of. And just a couple of quick random thoughts. Always bring a headlight. Uh, the electricity goes off. This is what it looks like. This happened in Haiti. <laughs> it was not fun. Uh, documentation is a problem. You know, be creative. Be very, very concise. You know, give the instructions on a cast if you're going to cast something. Uh, take nothing for granted. This is your sterile equipment. There might not be water in the afternoon. You know, take nothing for granted. Always think ahead. Before the patient goes to sleep, you want to shadow box every conceivable resource you might need so that you make sure you have it. And in disasters and mass casualty incidents, damage control is for the system more than for the patient. So you really want to get the patient in, do the damage control, get them out of the OR because you never know what's around the corner. And uh, that was a, a very important lesson that I learned. Appreciate your coworkers. I've met some great people on these trips and uh, uh, have been uh, really honored to, to uh, uh, make some great friends among patients as well. And so the, just to summarize the lessons outside the unit, I would say that, you know, as the Dalai Lama says, our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. And so when you go on these trips, that's, that's, you really need to have that in mind. And so and then briefly to close this up uh, and hopefully stay on time. Uh, just a quick lessons at home. If you find a mentor that's great, this was one of my uh, most influential mentors. This is Marion Jordan from the ABA. And the guy was having fun. He, was, had, he had fun every day at work. And I think Dr. Portenz is the same way. He has fun at work. And uh, those kind of role models are rare. Uh, appreciate the team. Really be thankful for the people you get to work with, the patients you get to take care of. I know I, I am, and I'm really lucky. Picking your partners. You know, partnerships in surgery are like marriage. You really have to like your partners. You want to be at your back all the time. And uh, uh, so, you know, recruiting carefully is important. Um, the you know, I would say, but nobody's going to care about your research or anything. I can't even remember the papers I wrote, let alone somebody else. And so to not focus so much on that is important. Really, it's, you don't want to take away from your family life. And I know that that's a lesson that took me a little bit longer to learn than I, I, I wish I had learned. Uh, but I think that's really important for if you're young in here. You're, you're young in our field. You know, this is, it's, it's really important. And really make, make work fun, because it can be. Get a life. Uh, and then this is my wife's advice. You know, I used to get these cards and I'd, uh, I'd recycle them or I'd throw them away. And she says, save the cards. And so I now have a box full of these cards. And you know, I go back once in a while, it really helps. So save the cards. And then be very grateful to the people that stick with you. That's my wife. We've been married 35 years in April and I'm married when we're 22. And uh, she's really, you know, be very grateful for that. And then in closing, I just want to say uh, uh, just a word about John Hansborough and then some thank yous. You know, he was the, you know, I'm, I was, I was uh, timid when I met him in a meeting because this is the guy who is clearly the rising star. He is the absolute, uh, uh, you know, role model surgeon. But, you know, uh, he was, when I was in Afghanistan, there was this cadre of guys, and they were called EOD techs, and they would, they would clear the routes, and they would go up ahead of the convoys, and, you know, under sniper fire, and, or they, or, and they, sometimes they, when they were defusing the bombs, they would go off, and you'd be operating, you'd meet them in the operating room, and uh, these guys, you know, cleared the way for us by showing 
what, what's out there. And, and Dr. Hansborough is like that. You know, he, he died of a disease of stress. And uh, you know, there's more and more of a recognition of that uh, in our own, in our field. You know, we're in a field, this burn and trauma field, where there's a lot of stress. There's a, there's a tremendous work ethic. Uh, we all work, you know, 100 hours a week. And uh, it, I think this is a, uh, Dr. Hansborough kind of led the way in an understanding of this problem. And I think that it's important, it's one of our duties as older guys to uh, make sure that the people that are coming up in our field understand that this is a issue that they need to address. Uh, up front. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you uh, to Dr. Potenza and the rest of the, uh, the team here, and uh, be happy to answer any questions.